So today we're going to continue through uh, this book. We're going to start into chapter 2 and try to finish the whole chapter today. Uh, But before we get started into chapter 2, if I was going to title this sermon anything, I would title it Mirror, Mirror. Uh, And I'm sure some of you have that experience every morning. You did this morning when you walked into the bathroom and you looked into the mirror. And probably if you're like me, uh, my uh, awareness of the gray hairs has become a little bit heightened lately because every time Matthew sees me, he makes it a point and says, wow, Daddy, you're getting a lot of white in your beard. So every time I look in the mirror... The mirror does not lie, unfortunately. You know, it would be nice if I could look in the mirror and it would reflect that 18-year-old boy that's still in my head, but that's not the case. The mirror shows the honest truth, the hard truth, and it's not always easy to digest. And I think today, as we work through this, we're going to get to a point where we realize that Scripture, uh, the law we're going to talk about later, is really like a mirror. And mirrors are meant to reflect a certain image, a true image. So we're going to start here at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and I'm going to use these first 11 verses to kind of recap where we were last week because I want to make an important point here. If you do studying on your own, and I would suggest that you do that, and you pull out a commentary, most commentators are going to tell you that Paul's attention has switched from chapter 1 to chapter 2 away from the Gentiles toward the Jews. However, I want you to know that 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 really is not how the text reads at all. Uh, It is very apparent through the context that Paul is still speaking to the Gentile audience here at the beginning of chapter 2. And the reason I say that is because of how Paul starts the text. He says, uh, you're going to have to advance the slides for me, I guess. You go to the first slide. This is what Paul says, next slide. You therefore, that word therefore... In the Greek, that word is joining what happened last, what we just read, to what's happening now. And Paul was speaking without doubt in chapter 1 to Gentile Christians. So have in your mind now, this is a recap because he's still on to uh, the Gentile audience. Now remember, in, in the book of Rome, the context is this. There are Jewish Christians and there are Gentile Christians. And, and at this particular point in history, when Paul is writing this letter... The Gentile Christians had stepped up into leadership roles in the church because the Jewish Christians were kicked out of Rome because they were still Jewish. They were making a fuss about a guy named Christ, and the Emperor Claudius was not happy about that. Uh, The Roman Empire did not like when there was commotion. They would squash commotion get rid of it because they liked peace. Uh, You can read about what's called the Pax Romana, which is just a period of Roman peace. And it's kind of deceiving because they achieve peace through force. But they kick all the Jews out of Rome. And because the Jewish Christians go with that group, the churches are vacant of some of the early leadership roles that would have been filled by Jewish Christians. And the Roman or the Greek Christians fill those roles. And now Paul's writing the letter because those Jewish Christians are coming back and they're finding, hey, wait a minute. These Greek Christians are leading the church and they're doing things differently and it's not the way we used to do it. So Paul writes to address this. Now here's one of the attitudes that was present. The Gentile or the Greek Christians, when the Jewish Christians came back, they had this attitude of our way is much better than your way. So Paul, uh, I told you last week, he tears this group down, but his intent is to build them back up later. So keep in mind as we read through this and we go through today's sermon, we're still in the tearing down mode. Okay, so I hope you have your still-toed shoes on. He says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Now I want to pay particular attention to verses 5 through 11. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. 
To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Now, notice that Paul is attacking this issue head on. God does not show favoritism. He doesn't favor one group over the other. He doesn't look more kindly on Greek or Gentile Christians or Jewish Christians. But just in this few verses, 5 through 11, we see that pattern that we talked about last week. The idea of knowing God, rejecting what you know about God, and then being handed over to wrath. Remember, I said that God will give us the desires of our heart. Even if the desires of our heart are set against Him, He'll give us exactly what we want. So what we know about God, we reject This whole idea last week we saw was that the pinnacle uh, of the experience that Paul was writing into was that people were replacing God, whether it was with idols or themselves. They were replacing God, and they knew that was wrong. They knew the truth, they rejected the truth, and they were handed over. And in verse 6, Paul quotes two Old Testament texts that say the same thing, Psalm 62.12 and Proverbs 22.12. When Paul said, God will repay each person according to what they have done. Now that's an interesting statement, and some of us would question, how can Paul say that we're going to be judged according to what we have done because we know that we're saved by grace through faith, not works? I had this discussion just a couple weekends ago, the whole idea of works. And how does that really fit in with saving faith? We well, remember last week, our works, what we do, are the evidence of the disposition that is within us. And Paul's going to continue to work through this uh, as he goes through the rest of the book. But you know, if we were to think of it in terms of people, I love drawing stick figures. And I'm going to draw a big black heart right here. Right? And people that have a big black heart do bad things. They can't help it. That's what they desire. But people that have a nice heart, and we're going to do it Grinch style, a heart that's really big. You know, the Grinch's heart grew what, 10 sizes? I don't know, it was three sizes, whatever. They do good things. That's just the truth. People with bad heart do bad things. People with good hearts do good things. So how is it that God can judge according to what we've done? Because what we do reveals what's inside. Jesus doesn't say anything any different. Jesus says that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And Paul Paul gets to this point. He says that those, in verse 7, those who by persistence in doing good seek glory. Now that word glory is really a word that identifies God. It's used most often to talk about the essence, one of the characteristics of God, His glory. When they seek that, Doing good, they seek that. They're going to gain eternal life. But notice what he says in verse 8. But those who are self-seeking. See, again, it's this whole idea of replacing God. If you're not seeking God, if you're seeking yourself, you've replaced God with yourself. And that's kind of where we were last week. Paul's talking to this Gentile audience. He's saying, listen, here's the problem. Here's not, not only what's happening in the church, but what's happening in the culture that surrounded the church is that people know the truth. They know some kind of truth about God. He uses the idea of creation. You know that there is a creator, but you've replaced the creator and worship created things. You've rejected the truth. Now you're being handed over. So that's where we ended 
And we know that Paul was condemning those people for the attitude that they had. And then we get to verse number 12 and we begin to make a transition from one audience to the next. So he begins to shift his attention at this point away from the Gentile audience and toward the Jewish audience. But he does it in a very interesting way because he ties both both groups to the law. Which for the Gentiles would have been a really hard pill to swallow. But notice what he says. He says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them or at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Now, this, this, is, this is why I wanted to have my notes, because you notice how tedious even just those few verses are. And here's what you can get out of those few verses. Paul says this. I, I think it can be abbreviated like this. He says this in several sentences, but here's the point. A person is judged based on what they know. And we have a hard time with this in the church. All right, so hang with me. A person is judged based on what they know. And Paul says, those without the law will be judged based on what they can comprehend about God apart from the law. Remember, in chapter 1, he talks about this idea of natural revelation. We can look at creation and surmise that there is a creator. We can come to the conclusion that something out there created everything that we see. And based on that conclusion... There is something within us that was designed to desire that Creator. And people without the law are going to be judged on that. So sometimes people ask you, well, how can God be such a good, loving God when if it's really true that you know, everybody has to hear about Jesus, what if He comes, what if Jesus returns and there's some people out there that have never heard about Jesus? And they always think, well, there's no defense for that, right? Well, yes, there is. People are judged based on what they know. And I'm a firm believer that if there is a group of people out there, an ethnic group, a tribe that has never heard about Jesus Christ, I still think those people can be saved by God's grace because they're going to be judged based on what they do know about God. That's what Paul's saying right here. How do we know about Jesus? Well, because the new law brought it to us. If they don't have that yet, they're going to be judged based on what they know. But those that do have the law, guess what? They're based on what they know about the law and what they've come to know about God through natural revelation. So in verses 13 through 16, Paul's using this statement to set up an interesting concept that I think he continues to unpack as we go through the rest of the book. But here's what I want you to write down that's very important. I think we'll brush on this as we continue to go through. There are really three types of people that Paul is going to talk about. And you think, wait a minute, I thought you said there was two, Greeks and Jews. <laughs> There's three types of people. There are those who hear the law and don't really do anything with it. That's the first type of person. Those who hear the law don't do anything with it. Second type, there are those who hear the law and do it. Do what it says. Now here's the third type of person. There are those who do the law without hearing it. That's what Paul just said, right? He said, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things required of the law, they are a law for themselves. And those who do it without hearing about it. How is that possible? Well, <laughs> it's because the Creator God puts inside of us this desire to know the Creator, and because there's a Creator, 
we know there's absolute truths. If you, you don't believe in absolute truth yet, you probably need to look into it because I can guarantee you if I threw a ball up, it would come down. That's an absolute truth. Now listen, here's the thing I want you to understand. When Paul says they're a law to themselves, this is not a rogue set of behaviors. This does not mean that they're doing whatever they feel like. But what it means is they're doing things that are pleasing to God. See, law for Paul, and we talked about this last week, the law for Paul is not just a list of rules. So remember last week we talked about those two Jewish perspectives, the Hillel perspective and the Shimei perspective. We said Paul is a Shimei Jew. But what Paul does is he adopts this Hillel perspective that the law is more about a disposition. It's about the state of a person's heart. And any time you act out of love for God, in Paul's mind, you are fulfilling the law. We'll talk about later what that really looks like. So, a good way to think of the law. Remember, I'm using the word law as in capital L law, Old Testament law. A good way to think of the law that these Jewish Christians would have been hung up on is to think of it like a mirror. They go to the law. The law reveals the truth about who they are. But the mirror can't fix you. Right? If I go stand in front of the mirror, I say, wow, uh, there are a lot of white hairs there. Matthew's right. The mirror is not going to fix the white hairs. It's just going to tell me that they're there. And that's the way the law was meant to function in these people's lives. They were to go to the law and look at it and let the, let the law tell them who they were, point out all the, the dirt and the grime, and then something else had to fix them. The law has no power to fix anybody. right? If the law had the power to, to fix people, Christ would have never come and died. But that doesn't mean that the law doesn't have a purpose. It's showing them who they were. Now, are you thoroughly confused yet? (laughs) Because I promise I'm going to put it together. Go to verse 17. By the time we get to verse 17, we're past the transition, and now Paul has turned his attention solely to the Jewish Christians in the audience. Okay? He says, now... If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know His will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you're a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now remember, Paul says God doesn't show any favoritism and neither does Paul because Paul is just as hard on the Jewish Christians at this point as he is the Gentile Christians. Maybe just a little bit harder because he says, now listen, you've heard me condemn everything that they're going on, all the attitudes that they're having, but he says really the reason that they are the way they are is because of the way you are. That's how he ends that. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now here's their attitude. He brings this idea of the law up right off the bat, and it's law, law, law. Uh, So I think what you need to begin to sense here and see what's unfolding based on Paul's writing is that both of these groups thought that their way was the best way to do things. And the Jewish people thought that their way was the best way to do things because, you know, we are God's chosen people. We have the law. We have the temple. We have the land. 
And we're doing what the law says. We're going and we're making our sacrifices. We're making the pilgrim, pilgrimage to Jerusalem on Passover, uh, on the Feast of Weeks. We're doing all those things. And you know what? That's the, that's the way that everybody needs to be doing it. Paul, Paul says, no, you're actually wrong too. And he gives him this list of questions. You have the law. You're teaching people knowledge and truth. But... You who teach others, are you teaching yourselves, he says. And he makes this interesting couple statements. He says, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? And he goes on to say, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And here's what the practice of the Jewish people was. Right? They, they would go into these pagan temples where they had their shrine set up with their pagan gods, and they would take the idols out of the temple. They would steal them from the temple because they thought that they were honoring God that way. So you see what they're doing there? There's a law that says, thou shalt not steal. But they're going and stealing other people's idols and breaking the law. Now, if you read through the book of Acts, what you'll find that's interesting about Paul, when Paul is brought, um, I think it's in, it might be in Ephesus. I'm not 100% sure. But there's the temple there to Artemis. And Paul is brought up before the, the city governor because he's causing a, a commotion. He's preaching the gospel. And the Jews aren't liking the fact that Paul's preaching the gospel. So the Jews stir up all kinds of people and they get him to attack Paul. And they take Paul to, to this Greek or Roman authority figure in the city. And the authority figure in the city looks at Paul and says, why are you doing this to this guy? Because he's not a blasphemer of our gods or a robber of our temples. So Paul is not going in and stealing their idols, but he's preaching the gospel. And this is what Paul's saying to those people, those Jewish people. He's like, listen, you don't have to go in and break the law to prove a point about God. Because what you're doing is you're actually proving the opposite you're leading people away because what you say is right, you're not even doing it. That's a problem. In other words, they're saying, well, we're born into this, right? We are born into this. We have the law. That makes us superior. Now, here's where it gets real tricky. You thought it was tricky before it gets worse. Verse 25. Verse 25. I might read this one a couple times for you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you did not, you had not been circumcised. All right. Uh, don't get hung up on the circumcision here. Paul is using this, this idea of circumcision because circumcision Decision represents the outward appearance of a person. Okay, So circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Okay, now we're going to move on. So then, because this is where it gets tricky. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? All right, let me stop for a second. I'm going to read that to you again. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, notice what Paul is saying. There is this person who has not been circumcised, but they're keeping the law's requirements. Paul has to be talking about something different than keeping the list of do's and don'ts because it is written in the law that a male must be circumcised on the eighth day after they're born. But Paul's saying, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements... Now, the Jewish audience would have said, wait a minute. <laughs> he's not keeping the requirements of the law because he's not circumcised. But Paul said, no, you're missing the point. Yes, he is. 
He's keeping the law's requirements because what? It's not the list of do's and don'ts, but it's the position of that person's heart. What is he going to say? Will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? See, they're, they're in right standing because they are doing what the law was intended to do. It's to change a person from the inside out. He goes on in verse 27, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a law breaker. You notice what Paul's saying? This person, he's keeping the requirements of the law. No, he's not circumcised. You're circumcised, but you're not keeping the requirements of the law. You think you are. You're doing the, you're doing the do's. You're not doing the don'ts. But inside, you're still messed up. You think you're okay, though, because you just have the law. What's the problem? What kind of people are these? They're hearing the law. They're not doing it. All right? Now, let's stop right there. What Paul is doing is he's solidifying this idea of the fulfillment of the law being more about a disposition and less about what a person is or isn't doing. Why would Paul do that? Because people get so caught up on the doing and the not doing that they lose the value of what the law is supposed to do within them. See, it's possible to know about God and not know God. And that's what's going on here on both sides of the coin. They know about God, but they don't know God. Let's finish up verse 28 and 29. And here's where it probably gets even more confusing. (laughs) A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Now, there's a whole line of thought out there that is really not mainstream, but I think there's a lot of value to it. That in Paul's mind... As we read through the rest of the book of Romans, I want you to tuck this away. In Paul's mind, being a Jew, a true Jew, is not about being born Jewish. It's about being a faithful person. And in Paul's mind, when he looks back through history, it didn't matter if a person was born an Israelite or not. That's not what made them Jewish. What made them Jewish was their faith in God. And I think Paul takes this idea and he extends it even into the New Testament era. And when he looks at faithful people, what he sees is the people of God. And if we think in that vein, that line of thought, then we would take on the role of Jewish. We are true Israel because of the faith that we claim through Jesus Christ. What Paul's saying is that only God sees the part of us that determines our righteousness. Only God sees the heart. And you really don't want praise from people. You want your praise to be from God. Because why? Oftentimes people praise us for what we do. They don't praise us for who we are. And God's different. God praises us for who we are, not what we do. So how do we break this down on our level? What's the next logical step that we can take in applying this to who we are, where we are? So the early church in Rome was experiencing tensions. And as we, as we go through the rest of the book, we're going to see that the tension was happening from within the church and with outside the church. We, we talked about that a little bit already. Uh, The Roman Empire was not real friendly to Christianity all the time, and the empire would persecute Christians, and we'll see that that begins to happen 
but there was tension coming from outside the church and tension coming from within inside and the church and the tension from within inside was the differences of opinions that these two groups of people had, the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians. They have completely different backgrounds, completely different values. The Gentiles on the one side would have come from a polytheistic worldview where they worship many gods, and we know that the Jews came from a monotheistic worldview where they viewed life through the law and through the one true God. But the reality is that both of these groups carried biases with them. And what they tried to do is they tried to take those, those biases, uh, those values that they had, and they tried to overlay them on top of this concept of following Christ and experiencing the grace of God. So we talked about those three types of people, those that hear the law and do nothing, those that hear the law and do good, those who don't hear the law but they do good without it. Now I want you to know there are those three types of people found within the church today. Those three very types of people, and I'll even go so far when I say the church, I'm using the big C universal church, but there are those three types of people in our midst today. There are those people who hear the law and they do something with it. They allow it to change them and transform them. There are those people who hear the law and they don't do anything with it. And there are those people who really don't know that much about the law, but you know what? They're, they do some pretty good things. Now, I told you that real, in reality, all of us in this room are Gentiles. I don't think anybody has Jewish history in here. Maybe you do, and if you do, that's good. But the majority of us are probably Gentiles. But when we read through the book of Romans, and actually when we read through the New Testament, we've come to a point in our history because of the way we have practiced church for so long that we actually more closely align with the Jewish audience than the Gentile audience. Let me explain. Because there's an attitude within the church. Well, we were raised in the church. We know the Bible. We show up. I used to be able to say we show up every Sunday. But the sad truth is now we, don't, we can't say we show up every Sunday because there's just a handful of us that do. We show up most Sundays. We wear the right kinds of clothes. Now this is the mindset of the Jewish people. We were raised in, in the nation of Israel. And what Jesus did is he, when he talked to these, his own people, he called them whitewashed tombs. You know, for the longest time, I didn't understand this. What in the world is he talking about a whitewashed tomb? Well, here's the reality. I got a good picture. If you think of the, the graveyards down in New Orleans, they're above ground. They build these big tombs, right? And the outside of those things are really beautiful, really ornate. But what's inside? Just dead people, right? Bones. And that's what Jesus says about the Jewish people. He says, you're whitewashed tombs, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. Right? The outside looks great, but the inside's in bad shape. Paul addresses this type of attitude again in his second letter to Timothy in chapter 3, verse 5. Paul makes the statement that people have a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. In other words, they look right, they look good, but they haven't experienced the real power of God in their lives. Let me tell you what that looks like in the American church today. That looks like being so consumed with just getting people inside the doors thinking that that's our job. That's not it. You realize when we focus so much on just getting people in the doors, we are focused on outward things. We are focused on what it looks like on the outside. Paul's saying, we've got be, to be better than that. We have to be concerned with allowing people to get to the point where this changes to this. 
Because if we just focus on this, here's what happens. We can change this from this, but they still have this. And that's an issue. This idea of following Christ is not a behavior modification program. It's not about getting people to do what we want them to do and not do what we don't want them to do. Right? Paul calls it a transformation, a metamorphosis. He said, behold, the old man is gone, the new creation has come. I mean, I wonder how many of us have really experienced the power of God, that transforming power where we literally get a heart transplant. Because when we do that, it's like, man, you know, there are some things that I'd like to say to these people, but I, I just don't. I don't. I can't. There's a, another slide, I think, after this one. You know, we're, gonna, we're working on a strategic plan here at Hannes Creek. And the questions that we're, we're asking, hopefully, is not just how do we get more people here, but how do we move people through the process of what we call discipleship, where they are transformed by the power of God. Now notice, it starts down there with this thing called a seeker. That's people, what are people, people are looking for something. And we've been pretty comfortable with getting those people that seek something to become regular attenders. And we think, okay, thank God, they're coming every Sunday. And it's almost like then we breathe a sigh of relief. Right? And there's a little bit of a push, but we want to get them to become members of the church. But I want to tell you, I'll be honest with you, this is my absolute 100% assessment. And you might be mad at me after this is over, but that's okay. There is very little desire for us at Hannes Creek to take any person past membership to what we would call a stakeholder. There's very little desire to take a person that has been coming and faithfully been a member of the church to actually equipping them to turn around and do the work of ministry either here or somewhere else. Why? Well, because like so many other places, we've become so wrapped up in this appearance of just getting people here and getting to believe the same things that we believe and do the same things we do. So what you have inside the church is you have two different groups of people. Just like the audience that Paul was speaking to. You have that group of people that are there. They're, they're, they're tried. They're the true. They've been there. They've done that. And then you have this group of people that sometimes creeps into the church, and you know what? They're on fire, but they don't know the Bible. They don't know that everybody should, expects them to dress a certain way, and really that expectation is not even a good expectation, but it's there. But inside them, there's something that's burning. And that creates tension in the church. Because we can have the tendency to sit on the one side and say, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I was born in the church. I was raised in the church. That's just not how we do things around here. And in the back, Paul's screaming to us through the book of Romans, your way is not the right way either. Why? Well, because at some point in time, there's a, there's a transition that starts to take place and it long, no longer becomes about what God desires for the church, but it becomes about what we want out of the church. See, it's possible to know the law. It's possible to know that, back, that Bible forwards and backwards and not know the God of the Bible. And don't get me wrong, there are those in the church that have been raised in the church, and they do the right things, they say the right things, and they know God. There's that third person, right? I <laughs> said so there's all three of us in the building this morning. And the point we have to come to is we have to be willing to look into this mirror 
and be honest with ourselves about what type of person we really are. Not because Sean said this or Sean said that, but because what does, what does the Bible tell us about who we are? When we read through this book of Romans, what is Paul saying to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What is he trying to say? Where do we fall on that paradigm? And because depending on where we fall on that paradigm, it really, it really kind of helps us understand how we're supposed to take this book. Because depending on where we fall, it challenges us in different ways. But as we get through the book, what you're going to find and hopefully come to realize is that while we may fall on different parts of the paradigm, we may be type 1, type 2, type 3, regardless of whether we're type 1, type 2, or type 3, we should all be reminded of God's unfailing faithfulness regardless of what category we're in. Because that's where we get to go to next. Now we get to leave that portion where Paul's banging and stepping on toes. And now he's starting to say, okay, here's a new perspective. Here's what I want you to see. And it's all about the faithfulness of God. And so here's a snapshot. I don't have a slide for this. Chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Well, he says, much in every way. Wait a minute, Paul. (laughs) But notice what he says next. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now, I think it's fascinating that Paul doesn't use the, the word law there. They haven't been entrusted with the law. They've been entrusted with the very words of God. So what brings about this change of identity? What brings about this change of perspective? Right there, God. And what Paul's saying is the only way that we can get from here to here is through a work of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we move up that that arrow there from seeker to regular attender to member to stakeholder, what does our mission statement say? We want to know Jesus. Notice that? We didn't say we want to know about Jesus. We want to know Jesus. You know who said that? I'll be real honest with you. That was intentional. You know who said that? Paul said that. Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We want to know Jesus. Now, what happens next? Grow in our relationship with Jesus. Those two things are key. Because if you don't do the knowing part and you don't do the growing part, guess what? You can't do the showing part. And then we want to go and tell others about Jesus. Well, why are we talking about all this? There are some big needs we have here at Hands Creek. I'm not going to lie. We had that discussion this morning on the way over here. The fifth Sunday, we don't have teachers for our kids. I know a lot of you are volunteering. And I really appreciate that. For those of you that are jumping in and doing something, uh, thank you so much. But for those of you that have been members here for a while and you just find yourself coming and coming and coming, you think, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do because I'm showing up. And you, you're not there yet. That's not, the, that's not the pinnacle experience of following Christ. The pinnacle experience of following Christ is becoming like Christ and doing what he did, and that's serving others. And that's really the transition we have to make here at Hannes Creek. We have to stop focusing on just coming and and being here. How do we, okay, we want to come, we want to be here, that's important, but how do we take it one step further and how do we start to serve others better? How do we serve our own people that come here? How do we serve people outside of here? Because when we make that transition, look out. That's when people are brushing up against God. 
that's when life transformation happens.